Welcome. In the last module, we took a look at the partitioning process in physical design automation. In this module, we will take a look at floor planning and routing. At the output of the partitioning phase, we have a set of blocks defined because we have divided the circuit into a set of sub-circuits, each being called a block here. We know the area of the block. We at least have an estimate of the area of the block because we know the circuit components that will go inside a block and how they will be interconnected and hence we have an estimate of the area of the block. We also know the possible shapes of each block and the number of terminals in each block because we know how many t wires will cross the partition of a, a given partition, how many wires will cross the given partition and go to other partitions and hence we know how many terminals that I will require because external connections across a partition can only be done through terminals at the periphery of each block and we have a net list specifying the connections between blocks and we consider two types of blocks here a fixed block a layout of a circuit within a block is known hence fixed dimension so if the complete layout of the circuit within a block is known it is pre-designed then the block is fixed or rigid and flexible block where the exact dimensions are not yet determined we have an estimate of the area but the exact dimensions had not yet been determined and hence their aspect ratios and sizes can be changed within a given bound Then what do we do at the floor planning phase? The input to the floor planning phase therefore is a set of blocks both fixed and flexible. The area of each fixed block, the area of each block AI equals to WI cross HI is known with cross height. The constraint on the, sh on the shape of each block rigid slash flexible is known. The pin locations of the fixed blocks, the terminals, the locations of the terminals are known and we know the interconnection among blocks as the net list. What do we require? We require to find locations of each block so that no two blocks overlap. So we want to obtain a relative placement of the blocks with respect to each other so that none of them overlap. Okay. So what is the objective? The objective is to minimize the total area of the layout on the on the chip and to reduce the net length for critical nets so we can if we place uh, two blocks which have a high um, which have a, a high amount of interconnection among them far apart from each other there will be a lot of wires uh, through the chip area long wires uh, through the chip uh, through the through the routing area of the chip connecting them and hence it will uh, it will lead to a loss uh, loss in the area that we can obtain we, it loss in the in uh, it will lead to a, re uh, a, a, a reduction it will lead to uh, a loss in the reduction that we can possibly achieve in the area of the chip. We also want to reduce the net length for critical nets. Let us say that uh, we have uh, a net uh, whose length cannot be more than a fixed length uh, some k nanometers. And uh, why? Because if the net length is more than this then my delay, the propagation delay through the wire will be such that this, the delay constraint for the signal which will pass through this uh, wire will be violated. And hence, we need to reduce the net length for critical nets. Critical length nets are what? They are the nets which take the highest amount of, uh, which, is of uh, which are the longest nets and hence the signals take the highest amount of time to propagate through them and the performance of the chip is often determined by the length of these critical nets. Okay. Uh, 
an additional requirement of the forward planning phase is also to freeze the shapes of flexible blocks. So we have flexible blocks, we do the floor planning and then we freeze the shapes of the flexible blocks. How do we estimate the quality of a floor plan? The quality of a floor plan is measured by several different criteria. For example, minimize area, minimize total wire length, mi maximize routability as we said of the wires through the routing regions, the vacant spaces on available on the floor of the chip. Now to understand the floor planning problem and the solution approach, we, um, we will look at its ILP formulation. So the problem is modeled as a set of linear equations using linear variables, and therefore an ILP. So we are given a set of n blocks s equals to b1, b2 dot dot up to bn which are rigid and have fixed orientation. And each block is a four tuple. We know the left bottom corner of the left bottom, the, we know the coordinates of the left bottom corner of the chip, we know the width of the chip and we also know the height of the chip. Now to ensure that any two blocks do not overlap. So now we want to determine, now we need to determine what are the conditions that we need to ensure so that any two blocks BI and BJ never overlap with each other. Now let us say that we have two blocks BI and BJ. Now the first one is that let us say that we have XJ to the right of XI. If that is so, if xj is to the right of xi, then xi plus wi must be less than equals to xj. To ensure that two blocks will never overlap, then we need to meet any, any one, at least one of these four constraints here. So what are they? xi plus wi less than xj. If xj or bj is to the right of bi. On the other hand, if bj is on the top of bi, then yi plus hi should be less than equals to y, yj. If bj is on the top of bi. Third one, if bj is on the left of bi. So xi minus wj has to be greater than equals to xj. Why? Because bj now is to the left of bi. Now if bj is below bi, then what happens? yi minus aj has to be greater than or equal to yj. So these four constraints need to be ensured to need to hold. In, uh, so at least one of these four constraints need to hold to ensure that the no two, no two blocks bi and bj will ever overlap. Now to obtain the set of constraints, we define two zero one variables, xij and yij for each vertex pair. For each vertex pair bi, bj, we define two zero one variables, z, uh, xij and yij. Now xij comma yij equals to 0, 0 if bi is to the left of bj. That is if the first constraint xi plus wi less than equals to xj. This is what we need to ensure, right? We, we will keep xij comma yij equals to 0, 0. xij yij equals to 1, 0 if bi is below bj xij yij is 1 0 if bi is to the right of bj and xij yij is 1 1 if bi is above bj right and let w be the sum of the widths of all the blocks that we have and capital H be the summation let w be uh, let summation wi let w equals to summation wi be the uh, be the summation of the widths of all the blocks that we have and h equals to summation hi be the summation of all the heights of the blocks that we have. 
Now, we write the constraints between any two pairs of vertices as follows. For each pair b i b j, we need to have x i minus x j less than equals to w. So, uh, they, they must be separated, They're, they must be separate, their left coordinates might, must be separated by less than equals to w. Similarly, uh, y i minus y j less than equals to capital H, the summation of the height. So, how far they can be apart? Um, it can be the summation of the heights. Right? So, these are trivial constraints which will always need to be satisfied. Now, how do we write the other four overlapping constraints? We said that at least one of the constraints need to be true. So, in our constraints, one of the constraints has to be true and the other constraints need to be trivially true. We will see how we will achieve this. So, x i plus w i less than x j plus capital W into x i j plus y i j. We said that when x j is on the right of x i, then what happens? Then x i j comma y i j equals to 0, 0. Right? So, if x i plus w i is less than equals to x j, if this is true, if this is true and this is what we want, that we want X, uh, b j to be on the right of b i, if you want b j to be on the right of b i, then we want this constraint x i plus w i less than equals to x j to be true and it should not be trivially true and see that this is what happens here. If this is what we want that a b j should be on the right of b i, then x i j plus y i j is 0, 0 and hence w into x i j plus y i j is also 0. So, this will not be trivially true. However, for the others you see the, that all the other constraints will be trivially true. Why? x i j minus y i j is 0 minus 0 is 0. So, h into 1. So, h is there. So, for a um, so w the y i plus h i less than equals to y j plus h will always be trivially true, right? Let us uh, and uh, in the third constraint, um, because x i j and y i j are both zero, no w will be there. So x i minus uh, capital W will have will not be equals to zero. So capital W into 1 minus x i j plus y i j will not be 0. Therefore, x i minus w i, uh, x i minus w j greater than equals to x j minus capital W will be trivially true. Similarly, uh, for the fourth constraint, uh, y i minus h j will be greater than equals to y j minus 2 h will be trivially true. Likewise, we will see that one of the constraints depending on what we want, we want a block to be placed on top or one on, on top of the other, on the right of the other, below the other or to the right of the other. Based on that, one of these constraints will be non-trivially, has to be non-trivially true. We have to make it true. The other constraints will be trivially true. And if any one of these constraints are satisfied, we know that these two blocks will never overlap. Right? With this understanding, we come to the mathematical formulation of the ILP for floor planning. Let us assume that our objective is to minimize the height y of the floor plan. So, what will be the final formulation then? We have to minimize y, the height of the floor plan subject to x i plus w i less than equal to capital W. So, where can w be placed farthest on the right of the chip such that x i plus w i of the width the, the block should be wholly placed within the area of the chip and for that x i plus w i less than equals to capital W needs to be true. y i plus h i less than equals to y. So, y is what we want to minimize. So, y i plus h i. So, the, the where can, can a block be placed maximum on the 
on the top part of the chip, uh, we have to satisfy the constraint yi plus hi less than equals to capital Y. Also, we saw these other two constraints xi minus xj less than equals to w and yi minus yj less than equals to h. And then we satisfy all these four constraints that we just mentioned in the last slide. Uh, one of these constraints will be true depending on the relative position of one block with respect to others and it has to be true for, for all pairs of blocks and for therefore for all yij pairs these constraints have to be jotted down and and then um, um, we will feed this to an ILP solver and the output will be an optimal solution with respect to the constraints that we have. Uh, um, the last uh, constraint of course is that uh, xi, xi and yi both have to be greater than 0. Right? The coordinates have to be greater than 0. So with this we, we uh, understand a mathematical formulation for the floor planning problem. With this we understand the ILP formulation for the floor planning problem. With this understanding we will now move to the routing problem in physical design automation. The problem of routing is as follows. Given a floor planning and placement and a fixed number of metal layers, we need to find a valid pattern of horizontal and vertical wires that connect the terminals of the nets. So we have the placed blocks, their exact positions known, and we know what which wires will be interconnected between these blocks. So in the routing phase, we need to find actual Manhattan paths through the vacant spaces within the blocks to connect these terminals. And what are the uh, objectives we, we may need or we may want to minimize the mi routing area. We may want to minimize the area required for routing so that the total area of the chip finally will be minimized. Now routing is uh, abstracted at uh, two different levels. One is the global routing, the other is detailed routing. So what is global routing? In the global routing, uh, the input is, uh, is the detailed placement after the floor planning and placement phase with exact terminal locations known. So we know the exact terminal locations of the blocks. Now we determine channels for each net. So we determine the channels for each net. So these are the channels. These are the channels. These are the empty regions, the channels between the blocks through which these routes route uh, these these wires have to be routed so determine channel or routing region for each net but we don't find out uh, we, we don't deal with who, where exactly within this channel my wire will be placed so which track within this channel is uh, through which my wire will be placed i don't uh, determine in the global routing phase i only find the, the an enumeration of the channels through which my wire, a wire between any two terminals should pass. For example, let us say um, if we consider, um, if, if we consider um, this, 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 to this one, this net, this net. If we consider this net, we found that it should go through this channel and then this channel and then this one here. Right? So this is the position it should take. There could be other uh, more complicated ways in which you route a particular uh, um, route a particular net. So the objective is to minimize area or minimize congestion. So we need to balance, uh, we have a total routing area, different regions and we need to balance uh, the, the congestion within each of the different routing regions within the different routing regions that we have and we want to minimize the congestion in these areas so that the overall um, uh, area of uh, the routing region um, uh, will be minimized. So it's to minimize area or congestion and timing. Now what we do in the detailed routing phase 
in the detailed routing phase we do the routing for each channel now at the global routing after the global routing phase we have known what are the wires that will pass through a given channel so input channels and approximate routing from the global routing phase so determine the exact route and layers for each net so through which route and through which layer will these wires pass right uh, will these wires uh, pass is is found out in the detailed routing phase so we take each channel at a time from the global routing phase we know what are the wires that will pass through this channel and then we find an exact track for each of these wires the objective is to obtain a valid routing minimize area meet timing constraints etc additional objectives could be minimize vias vias are the connections between two distinct layers uh, on a chip so no, we have different layers on which the chip is designed we have abstracted the uh, as the chip as a single layer but there can be multiple layers and there are connections between layers these connections are called vias and uh, routing or wiring is typically done through metal layers um, so there are metal layers and polysilicon layers and uh, 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 through which uh, wiring can be done and the connection between these layers are called vias and we and one of the objectives of routing could be min is could be to minimize the number of vias now we take at uh, take a look at a distinct routing uh, type uh, now we take a look at a distinct type of routing called grid routing it comes within the global routing phase the layout surface is assumed to be made up of a rectangular area of grid cells some of the grid cells act as obstacles which are basically circuit blocks blocks that are placed on the surface and some nets that are already laid out so we will now understand a specific um, global routing strategy called grid routing so in the grid routing the layout surface is assumed to be made up of a rectangular area of grid cells some of these grid cells act as obstacles so what could be the obstacles they could be blocks that are placed on the surface or they could be some net that are already laid out so now we want to lay a new new net we cannot bypass or we cannot cross these nets because that it will create an electrical short and we cannot cross through the blocks because those are circuit blocks so mm, the remaining vacant space we have to do the wire routing through the remaining vacant space available so what is the objective objective is to find out a path a sequence of grid cells that is for connecting two points belonging to the same net we do this through lee's algorithm so one of the important grid routing algorithm uh, one of the important grid routing algorithms is the lee's algorithm what are the characteristics of the lee's algorithm lee's algorithm with respect to the grid that we have produces an optimal strategy so what do we mean if a path exists between a pair of points s and y for two terminal nets it produces an optimal strategy if a path exists between a pair of points s and t it is definitely found it always finds the shortest path and it basically uses depth first search the time complexities are big o of n square for a grid of dimension n cross n so what do we do we have in grid routing we assume the floor of the chip to to be uh, as as a grid we assume the floor of the chip to be a grid a grid consisting of uh, n columns uh, n n vertical n n vertical wires so we um, in grid routing we assume the floor of the chip to be composed of a grid the grid has n vertical wires and n horizontal wires in an n cross n grid right so one of the important grid routing algorithms is lee's algorithm in this algorithm uh, in this algorithm we do basically do a breadth first search to find um, the a path between um, between uh, two terminals 
to find a route between two terminals if a path exists between a pair of points s and t it is definitely found and it always finds the shortest path these are its two properties there are three phases to the lee's algorithm in the first phase we say this to be the wave propagation phase it's an iterative process during step i non blocking grid cells at manhattan distance i from grid cell s s is the source and t is the target so at step i non blocking grid cells at manhattan distance i from grid cell s are all labeled with i labeling continues until the target grid cell t is marked in in step l so labeling continues until the target is reached l is uh, l is the length of the shortest path so let's take an example and see in this example we see that here is the source s here is the source s now in the first it we said that it the, there is a wave propagation breadth per search and it and it happens in iterations in the first step so if you go to the algorithm in step i non blocking grid cells at manhattan distance i from the grid cell s are all labeled with i so we see that in step 1 from uh, in the, in this this cell is at manhattan distance 1 from s this one is at manhattan distance 1 from s this one is also at manhattan distance 1 from s and hence these are labeled with 1 if you see this this 2 is at manhattan distance 2 from s this is also at manhattan distance 2 from s this is also at manhattan distance 2 from s this is also at manhattan distance 2 from s likewise we go on propagating a, a wave right uh, and at each level i we label cells with i with the number i for um, to 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 un to understand to denote that these cells are at distance manhattan distance i from the source s and we go on doing this until the target is found for this case our target it is at this position and we see that the um, it is it is found in the eighth step we after seven we come to eight so it at it, it is at a distance eight from the source so again it is an iterative process during step i non non blocking grid cells at manhattan distance i from grid cell s are all labeled with i labeling continues until the target grid cell t is marked in step l l is the length of the shortest path the process fails if t is not reached and no new grid cells can be labeled during step i t is not reached so when do we fail when when does the lee's algorithm fail t cannot be reached and no new grid cells can be labeled because it's a breadth first search it will do an exhaustive search and uh, if the target is not there then it will not be able to find because let us say the target is at a place where it is Mm, it it is surrounded on all sides by an obstacle if it is not found surrounded by all sides by an obstacle lee's algorithm is bound to find it right however there is another um, uh, case in which lee's algorithm can fail if we bound the number uh, of steps in, in um, through which the iteration can progress to at most m so t is not reached and equals m so we cannot do a breadth first search beyond the iteration m then that is some upper bound and we do not find a target t then the process fails however if i if i do not have such an upper bound and uh, there is at least one available path to the target lee's algorithm will always find it because it's an exhaustive search through wave propagation using breadth first search now the second phase is the retrace phase so we systematically backtrack from the target cell t towards the source s right backwards from the backwards towards the source s if t is reached if t was reached in step i then at least one grid cell adjacent to it will be labeled i minus 1 and so on so what happens is that if so so now after phase 1 Um, we backtrack and go back to the source so for example we can take this path so there is if t is reached at at step 8 let us say then there will be at least one 
with with a, with the uh, with a step value uh, i minus one uh, here eight minus one. So we have a seven here. So we could take any one of them. Let us say we take this one, and we progressively go back to the source s. So we go back seven six five four three two one zero, or we could take seven six five four three three seven six five four three two one zero. So not this one. I have made a small mistake. So it will be. Seven six five four three two one s, right? It could be any. It could be any other path rather. It could be this also. Seven six five four three two one s. Now all these paths have the same Manhattan distance. All are shortest paths. This is another important thing to note. So if t was reached during step five, then at least one grid cell adjacent to it will be labeled i minus one and so on. By tracing the numbered cells in decreasing order, we can reach S following the shortest path. There is a choice of cells that can be made in general. In practice, the rule of thumb is not to change direction of the retrace unless, unless one has to do so. Why? Because this reduces the number of bends in the wires. Right? Now, therefore, although all have the same path, we will favor this path, for example, and this path uh, with against this path, right? We'll favor this path and this path against this path. Okay, so this uh, this was the second phase of the Lee's algorithm. In the third phase of the Lee's algorithm, uh, what do we have? Um, in the third phase of the Lee's algorithm, we clear the the labels that we created, the redundant labels that we created. All labeled cells except those corresponding to the path just found are cleared. The search complexity for this clearing process obviously is the same as the wave propagation itself because uh, it, if that was a wave propagation and this will also be another wave propagation to find out all cells which I have labeled in this path to provide a connection between these uh, two terminals in this two terminal net. Uh, uh, only thing that in, the, in this clearance phase, we have to keep the path that we have chosen in, in phase two and delete all other steps so that I can further progress uh, the algorithm for another two terminal net. With this uh, small introduction to routing, we come to the end of this module.